This is a 2001 Audi RS4 Avant, and it's a fast wagon, but not just any fast wagon. This was the king of fast wagons in its day. 375 horsepower in a compact wagon body. This thing is so incredibly cool, and today I'm going to review it, the B5 RS4 Avant, and show you all of its quirks and features. <laughs> Before I get started, I should point out that this RS4 Avant was purchased on Cars and Bids, which is my enthusiast car auction website. This RS4 Avant had low mileage, it's finished in the very best color, and it sold for $91,000, which was a record price for a B5 RS4 Avant. But this car deserves it because it's so cool. Anyway, if you're looking to buy or sell a cool modern enthusiast car from the 19 80s and up, like this RS4, Cars and Bids is the place to do it, with daily auctions and great selection of awesome cars at carsandbids.com. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the B5 RS4 Avant with a little overview of what this car is. Obviously, a high-performance wagon. It was made from 1999 through 2001, so production didn't really last for all that long, and they didn't make very many, only around 6,000 of these for the entire world. Now, this followed up on the Audi RS2 Avant, which I own and cherish and love. That was like the first fast Audi wagon, and this was its successor. The RS2 was based on the Audi 90, which came before the A4, and then this was based on the original A4. So the DNA is there from the RS2 to this car in terms of fast, compact Audi wagons. Now, in this generation of RS4, they were all wagons. There was no other body style offered. It was just the RS4 Avant. It wasn't until the next generation, the B7, which came out in like 2006, that they finally did a sedan and a convertible in addition to the wagon to make for more RS4 body styles. For this one, wagon only. Now, there are a lot of cool things about the B5 RS4 Avant, and I've already told you a couple of them. Low production number, fast wagon, but possibly the coolest was the powertrain. Twin turbo V6, 2.7 liters, just like the Audi S4 at the time, also had a twin turbo 2.7 V6, but that was pretty much where the similarities ended with the two powertrains. Because to create this engine, Audi took its 2.7 bi-turbo V6 and sent it to Cosworth, which is a famous British engineering and engine tuning company, which Volkswagen Group owned at the time this car was on sale. So they took the engine to their new subsidiary, Cosworth, and said, make it faster. And Cosworth did. They changed everything. The cylinder heads, the pistons, the tuning, the intake, the turbos were different, the intercoolers. Cosworth basically changed the entire powertrain to get more power and performance out of this engine. They even changed the exhaust for just a little bit more sound and a little bit more free-flowing horsepower. The result was a staggering increase. The S4 from this era had 270 horsepower. This had 375, and the S4 had about 200 90 pound-feet of torque. This was at 325. Those were monstrous numbers, especially for a little wagon this size. It did 0 to 60 in under 4 seconds, which is still incredibly fast today, so just imagine it 20 years ago in a station wagon. Now, it's worth pointing out that Cosworth also tuned the RS6 from this era, and then Volkswagen decided they didn't need Cosworth anymore, and they sold them. So the only two Cosworth-tuned Audis are this this one and the same era RS6, and that was it. By the way, one quirk worth noting about the engine since we're up here is just how crammed in to this engine bay it really is. This was always a complaint about the B5 Audis, the A4s and S4s from this generation. There's just not any space to do any work on this powertrain, and you can really see that reflected here, just smushed in there as tightly as possible to get this engine into this car. But, of course, the changes for the RS4 went well beyond the significantly increased power output. There 
there are a lot of other upgrades to this car. And one of them is very obvious the moment you look at it, it's wider. This car had so much more power, it needed a wider track and wider tires in order for the handling to effectively deal with the extra performance. So this car is about 2.6 inches wider than a standard A4 or S4 of its day. And that meant primarily widened fenders. You can see the fronts are very wide to accommodate the wider track and tires. And it's the same deal in back. They widened both the fenders and the rear doors, as you can see, which obviously required them to change the rear doors. And in fact, basically all of the body panels had to be changed in order to accommodate this wider vehicle. I read online that only the hood and the roof were carried over from the standard A4, although I personally think the front doors were probably also carried over. But regardless, there were significant body changes to this car just to create the RS4, not just powertrain, brakes, suspension, that kind of stuff. They really made a different looking vehicle too. And then there were the gills. One of the most distinctive aspects about the entire look of this RS4, these little gills in the front bumper directly in front of the wheels. I always thought they were for style to distinguish the RS4 from the regular S4 or A4, but in fact, they do apparently have a purpose. This car had side mount intercoolers in order to help cool the turbos, and these gills would help bring air into the side mount intercooler and help provide some of that cooling. So the gills really do have a function, and they are distinctive to the RS4. But anyway, next up, here is a fantastic Easter egg on the outside of the RS4. In back, in the bumper, you can see there are these three little horizontal black vents at the bottom of the bumper, three in a row. That was done to pay tribute to the Audi Sport Quattro, which was Audi's famous 1980s rally car. It had three horizontal black slots in its front grille, and it was a very distinctive look of that car. So to pay its respects to that famous Audi, the RS4 has something similar, but integrated into its back bumper, a little Easter egg back here. But anyway, since I'm on the outside of this car, let's talk badging, which was wonderfully subtle. Audi didn't do much to brag that this was the ultra high performance version. You had on the back this RS4 badge, which admittedly is relatively large, and you also had one in the front grille, but that was it. There's no other badging on the outside. You didn't have giant RS badges on the huge brake calipers or fender vents that said RS. None of this stuff you get in a lot of modern cars. It was very subtle out here. In fact, the wheels don't even say S or RS or have the little red RS stripe. None of that. They didn't say anything. From the side, there was no badging at all indicating what this car was. You just had to pick up on the subtle cues like the wider body or the small number of badges that do exist. And then there was the color. Audi sold these RS4s in several colors, but this was the one to get. They called it Nagaro Blue, and it has become absolutely synonymous with high performance Audis ever since. The color was originally debuted on the RS2, my RS2, where it was called RS Blue, but then Audi decided they wanted to offer it on non-RS models as well, specifically on the S4 from this generation. So they renamed it to Nagaro Blue, and they've been offering it basically ever since on their performance cars. And it is absolutely the color to get. It is perfect for this car, and it looks so wonderfully fantastic. Another touch on the outside of this car that is wonderful, the rear view mirrors are silver, which is a trend that started here and has continued on high performance Audis basically ever since. These silver mirrors to look cool and help them stand out from regular boring Audi models with their body colored mirrors. But anyway, next we move inside the RS4 where it is shockingly subtle in here too. It doesn't scream at you that it's an RS4 the way that a lot of modern performance cars do. You only have the RS4 badge in a few places. On the door sill, when you open the door, you can see it there. And you also have it at the base of the steering wheel, which is a cool little subtle reminder that you have an RS4. You also have it in the gauge cluster. You can see the tachometer says RS4. And those are pretty much the only RS4 badges in here. Although there is one 
one other RS4 badge that is exceptionally cool, and that would be the seats. You can see RS4 is imprinted into the backrest in the seats directly above Recaro. And the seats themselves are different from what you'd get in a regular A4S4. They're sports seats with bigger bolsters to help keep you in place going fast around corners. And so you have these cool Recaro sports seats with RS4 imprinted, and that certainly was a nice application of the RS4 badge in here. Now, some other nice upgrades to the RS4 models. For one thing, you can see the carbon fiber trim. You can see it right here on the door panel, and you can also see it on the dashboard right here, kind of going one carbon line across the car. And it's in a few other places too, like the center control stack, center console around the shift lever, some carbon trim, which helped give this sort of a performance feel inside. You also have a six speed manual transmission in here, which was mandatory. A4 and S4 models you could get with an automatic, but not the RS4. It was six speed manual only. That's the only way they made these cars. But aside from those RS4 upgrades and benefits, the rest of this interior is really just pretty similar to a B5 Audi A4, the A4 from the late 90s and early 2000s. And I know that because I owned a B5 Audi A4 when I was in college. Now it was a crappy used high mileage automatic one, but a lot of this stuff is the same in this interior. And that means I know where all of the quirks and features are. For instance, this panel here is actually a cup holder. You press it, it pops out, you put your drink there, and then condensation happens and your drink spills all over your climate controls and your stereo. So it was a terrible placement for a cup holder, but that's where it was. You also have this little switch at the end of the wiper stock. It's unlabeled and sort of hidden, but you press it and it cycles through various different pieces of information in the gauge cluster screen. You can see, push it, and it changes what it's displaying in there. More secret and hidden though, there's a button on the bottom of the wiper stock. If you press that, it turns off the gauge cluster display entirely. So you don't see it at all anymore in case you don't want a gauge cluster display. And by the way, speaking of the gauge cluster display in this particular car, it is especially fantastic because when it tells you the door is open, it's actually showing the wrong door. You can see I open the driver's door and it shows the passenger door being open. And same deal, you open the passenger door and it shows the driver door being open, which I'm sure is just some minor software fix, but it is also such a wonderful Audi electrical issue that just seems so correct in this car. But anyway, moving on to the rest of the quirks in this interior, one of them is the way you turn on the headlights, which is a stock coming off the steering column directly next to the turn signal stock and in basically the same spot. This is especially weird. I remember valets could never figure it out when I had my A4. They could never figure out how to turn on the lights in that car because of the weird dual stock situation on the left side. Next up, another wonderful quirk in here, going back to the center and the stereo, you can see many buttons arranged all in the center, but the cool part is how you turn it on and adjust the volume. Press this button in the center and it pops out, and then the stereo is on, and then that pop out becomes the volume knob, and you can twist it from there. If you want to turn off the stereo, just push it back in, and then it goes back in. Obviously, you don't need access to the volume control anymore since the stereo is off, which is kind of an ingenious idea. Next up, another fantastic quirk in this car, the seats are manually operated. Actually, not entirely. Some parts of them are power, but if you want to go forward and backward, that part is manual, even though this car came out at an inflation-adjusted price of around $100,000 back when it was new, but power seats were still an option. Next up, another interesting quirk. Speaking of the seats, heated seats in this car, of course, no surprise, it was a luxury vehicle. The weird part is it has six stage heated seats, not just on or off. You can see this slider adjusts to six different levels in case your butt is so discerning that you can tell the difference between heated seat three and heated seat four, and you have a preference. And finally, the last thing I want to show you up here is this little plaque in the windshield, which is kind of a strange one, substitute for VIN, VIN number, you're not really sure what this is. This is here because this particular RS4 has been federalized to meet US standards. This car is not yet 25 years old, meaning you can't just import it and then drive off into the sun. You actually have to go through a federalization process to convert this car to meet US standards. So this RS4 was sold new in France, it was then in Japan, and now it has been imported to the United States and federalized to bring it here. Now the federalization 
production process is quite grueling and quite difficult, but early in the B5 RS4's life, there was a company that brought over a few and federalized them, which created sort of a pathway for other importers to do it. And so there are a few B5 RS4s that have been legally imported and fully federalized to meet US standards, and that includes this car. Not many are here, but there are a few, and it's really, really special. But anyway, next up we move on to the back seat in the B5 RS4, which in a word is tight, really tight back here. But that was kind of the reality of cars this size from this era. If you wanted a true family car, you had to step up to an A6 or an S6 or an RS6. If you wanted an A4 size car, you got a back seat, but it wasn't intended to be used all the time, especially by adults. It was there for extra practicality, but just not huge. Now, in keeping with that ethos, the back seat isn't especially exciting either. Not much going on back here. You do have RS4 imprinted in the leather, as you can see, just like you did up front, and right above Recaro, which looks incredibly cool. But other than that, there wasn't really anything interesting back here, except the center armrest. It folds down, not that unusual, but it has probably the strangest center rear armrest storage area I've ever seen. You can open up this panel and then stick stuff down into the center armrest, so it's sort of gone down there, which is kind of odd, be weird and hard to get stuff out, but it would be a nice hiding place for things you really didn't want discovered. Other than that, you do have RS4 on the door sill, which also looks pretty cool, and you have carbon fiber trim on the doors, just like you had up front, but that's kind of it. There's no climate control vents back here, there's no USB ports for charging your devices. Sitting in the back of the RS4 was intended for sitting, not enjoying or fidgeting with your electronics. But the back seat of the RS4 was also for folding down if you wanted. The cool thing about this car is it was a wagon. And so that meant you pop open the tailgate and you have pretty good cargo space back here where you can stick your items to carry dressers or televisions if you want to go 150 miles an hour on the Autobahn with them. But if you wanted more space, you could fold down those back seats. And then you have a really large cargo area back here where you have a lot of room for transporting a lot of items at very high speeds. And next up, also worth noting, another interesting item about practicality in the cargo area of this car, there is a cargo net built into the back seats back here. You can see it back here, it's integrated and you can lift it up, it extends out and then it clips into the sides and forms this like netted space between the passenger compartment and the cargo area. Now, you can use that to keep your cargo in place, but really what it's there for is pets. If you wanna stick a dog in the cargo area, you don't want them climbing into the passenger compartment, so you can bring your dog with you at 150 miles an hour on the Autobahn and there's even a pet cargo net built into this car for just that purpose purpose. Now, aside from the fact that the cargo area is here and it's nice and it's practical, there wasn't anything especially unusual or quirky or interesting about it, except the way you access the tailgate. There are two different tailgate poppers, both basically in the same place. You have this one on the left, you stick your hand in here and the tailgate opens. You can also stick your hand on the right and pop it and the tailgate opens. And when you look up above the license plate, you can see there are two distinct left and right tailgate poppers that both do the very same thing, which to me makes absolutely no sense, but leave it to the Germans to create a redundancy even for the tailgate popper in <laughs> back. Doesn't really make a lot of sense. And by the way, speaking of opening panels in this car, one of my favorite things about Audi models from this era is the way you open the hood. Obviously there's a release in the footwell like for most of these cars, but then when you go to unlatch it, the latch comes through one of the Audi rings in front, which is a wonderful subtle little detail, and you pull on that and that's how you open up the hood, which is just a cool little piece of attention to detail for this car. Now, before I go drive this car, I wanna mention one quick thing. This vehicle is modified, slightly, but it's modified. It's on coilover suspension, it puts the ride a little lower, and obviously it changes the ride and handling from stock just a little bit, and this car also has an aftermarket exhaust. Now, I don't tend to review modified cars, but these are hard to find. There's maybe 10 or 20 federalized RS4 Avants in the entire country, so I really couldn't be picky. And those modifications are relatively tame. Some people did crazy mods for way more power in 
these cars. So this one is relatively unmodified, but worth mentioning before I go take it on the road. And so those are the quirks and features of the B5 Audi RS4 Avant. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the B5 RS4 Avant. I'm incredibly excited for this. For a kid who, uh, when I was in college, I had a B5A4, I met my wife in that car. Um, but it was a Tiptronic and it was a zillion miles and it was a terrible used car at that time and, and the Tiptronic eventually failed. And of course now I have the RS2, which is the predecessor to this car. And so combining those two is kind of special. I've always wanted to do this, but these cars aren't legal here uh, unless you federalize it like this one has been. So it's a rare opportunity. Here goes. First thing I notice when I sit inside this car and drive it is that <laughs> it's better than the RS2. <laughs> the RS2, as much as I love it, is kind of an older feeling car. This one does a great job of living in that wonderful space between feels vintage and cool, but also feels relatively modern. Um, so this interior is really nicely put together. It's well done, well crafted. Um, but also the car still feels like modern car fast, which is a pretty good combination of having sort of like this cool old school, but also nice, but also kind of modern and, and fun to drive. Overall, this car is clearly tighter than the RS2, which is not that surprising. My RS2 is a 1994 model, this is 2001. They learned a lot in that almost decade. And so this car just feels like it's more solid, better put together. The mileage is a lot lower in this car as well, but I think a lot of it is just a simply better build quality after you know many more years and, and improvements at Audi as well. One interesting thing about this car I'm finding right now um, is that it's actually a fairly normal car to drive if you're gonna drive it normally. Um, you could definitely daily this and I'm kind of <laughs> impressed with the way that it just feels cruising along. I mean, this just, I, it feels like I'm just driving a regular Audi station wagon if I want to, which is sort of a neat thing because that was always kind of the point of these RS cars is that they were practical in addition to being incredibly fast and exciting. So with that in mind, let's talk about uh, incredibly fast and exciting for a second. Wow. Wow. Wow, boy, it's so quick. It's so much faster than RS2. <laughs> it feels really, really quick. I will say it does have a similar uh, setup to the RS2 wherein uh, the power doesn't really come on unless you are absolutely rocking it. You gotta be high in the rev range. I always describe people the RS2 as an old school turbo where it spools up and doesn't kick you in the face until 4,000 RPM. This is similar to that. This car still feels a little bit faster uh, below 4,000, 3,000 RPM. It feels okay but it feels especially quick when you wake it up and you get up there in the range. Yeah, 5,000, 6,000, then it really comes alive. One interesting thing, the shifter feel isn't quite as good, I would say, as RS2. It feels a little more vague and a little more uh, pillowy, if you will. It's not just like a notch, notch into gear, which is something that I generally uh, prefer. The steering and handling in this car, though, is amazingly excellent. It corners really, really well. Now, it's on coilovers and it's lowered. The current owner is gonna bring it back to stock because he bought it thinking it's like a truly special car that will rise in value and, and will be coveted, uh, especially less in a modified way. And I agree with that. But, um, but the result is that it handles really, really well, fantastically. And actually the ride quality isn't so bad on these coilovers. Um, there's no real drawback, but I'd be curious to drive it with stock suspension and see how it is then. Wow, this car is fantastic. This car is a fantastic improvement on the RS2. Um, I'm really, really impressed by the, the driving experience, the feel. It just feels so solid. Um, I, like I said, I owned a B5 and I don't remember it feeling this solid. I remember it breaking all the time, which probably this car would too, but I don't know. It, <laughs> it feels great. This is a tremendously fun car to drive. The precision isn't quite there. The precision of the steering, it's a little vague on center. It doesn't change immediately, but the car is just excellently planted in corners and you just have an enormous amount of confidence in what it can do. The wider track of the RS model definitely helps. Ultimately, these things are tremendously expensive and, and it's a that's a big stumbling block for a lot of people interested in a fun, fast wagon. Not a lot of people out there wanna pay 90 plus for one, but I don't know. I think it's cool as hell and I get it. And I think it's awesome. It's a really, really thrilling car. And it's a great intersection of performance and still kind of an old school feel and specialness because so few of these were made. 
I love this car. <laughs> I really do. I'm a big wagon guy already. Obviously, I have the predecessor to this car, so I'm into that. Um, no surprise, but I really love this car, and it really does drive excellently. And so that's the B5 RS4 Avant. This is an amazing car, and I really want it. I wish I had bought this when it was being auctioned on cars and bids, but I'm thrilled that I had the chance to check it out now. It is fantastically cool, and now it's time to give this RS4 Avant a Doug score. And the Doug score is here, 62 out of 100, placing the RS4 Avant here against other high-performance hatchbacks and wagons. Actually, in amazing company, beating out the brand new Volkswagen Golf R and falling just short of the Ford Focus RS. Truthfully, this is a seriously impressive car, and I was stunned by how much I enjoyed it. It's like a faster, more focused, more modern, better version of my RS2, which makes sense because that's exactly what it is. The RS2 is more iconic, for sure, but the RS4 is an impressive car to drive, though reliability would be a big concern. Still, when it's running, the RS4 is amazing, even better than I expected, and I had high expectations. 